I used to want to live in New York, but the more that I, I guess, grew up, the more that I don't like city life personally. Yeah, and the more that I've been traveling, um, my wife has her family here. So it's a lot easier for her to kind of just be alone without me, but have family around her. Right, 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 right. For sure. For sure. That's honestly, dude, that's a really important, that's a, that's a good thing you figured out. Um, because the, the, I, I've, I'm a, I'm single, you know, I'm, I'm not married. I don't have kids. So like I, it's easy, it's easier for me to travel all over the place, but even trying to maintain like a relationship with, right. with a girlfriend or even my friends, man, can get a little tricky with all the travel, which is a blessing and a curse. Cause I don't want to complain about being busy and, and, and all that. But like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's often something I've wondered, especially lately. Like, how do I, if I had a family, if I had kids, like how the fuck would I make that work with this much right. travel, you know? That's pretty much like one of the reasons why I started this podcast also is, uh, because I tend to think that I'm pretty young, especially at, for like a DP. I'm only 26 and You're just super people, young, man. See, so kid wasn't wrong. Yeah, I said, I, I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the people that I usually work with, like my gaffers, key grips, they're usually like 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years old, their yeah. fathers, their husbands. And they've just given me so much insight and knowledge into how they've been able to manage things and how they've gone through this industry that I was like, why am I the only one to be able to kind of learn about this? So that's part of the reason why I started this to ask people just about how they're going through life pretty much. Yeah. I think that's great, man. It's super important. I think also that like the, the, not just the physical challenges of traveling and, and inconsistency in your schedule and being all over the place, but but also I just think the mental toll that has too of like, you know, not knowing when the next project's going to be and not knowing where it's going to be. And I mean, I've had times where I've made plans to do X, Y, Z, and like I'll literally be like two nights before I'm supposed to, I don't know, again, go to a friend's uh, birthday or, or go to right. an event a friend's having or something like that here in the city. Like I'll get a text from my agent and she's like, yo, if you're down, you got to take this opportunity. <laughs> they want you to go to San Francisco and shoot this. You know what I mean? And like you can't, it's really hard to say no. And anyway, so trying to find a balance with all that stuff, right? which ultimately find- probably is the trick, right? It's just it's not one or the other. It's balance. I mean, that, that's I, yeah, with most I, things in life, right? I had a, I did a podcast yes two days ago. Are you familiar with uh, Olin Collardy? Do you know? Yeah, him? yeah, yeah, dude. Olin yeah, is a, is a good man. dude, man. I love yeah, Olin. He's yeah. great. I had a, I had a chat with him the other day, and I was talking about this thing that I'm kind of working on, and it's sort of like trying to find the. Everyone tries to find the balance between relationships and work, and I think that what I've been trying to work on is like maybe the balance that we all try to find is really understanding that there's always an imbalance and at times work takes priority. And then at other times, friends and family and relationships take priority. So maybe it's just like at a certain yeah. point in your life, depending on where you are, one or the other should take priority over the other. I suppose so. I think, I, I think, I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that the tricky part is just, you know, for me, at least in, in my relationships, it's like, I can factor in how I feel, whether this is a period in my life where I want work to take precedence or other life stuff, but that right. doesn't account for the way the people around me, you know what I'm saying? Mm, if there's people 100%. who need, need me or, or, or that I should be there for at that moment, even if work is booming and I want to take advantage of that, it's like, yeah, I've just had, you know, I've had a couple relationships that like, I, it wasn't like so cut and dry that like things didn't work out because of work, but like, it's pretty clear that my lack of availability or, or inconsistency was like a fact, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, but I mean, it's good for you, man. You got a wife and shit. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel lucky because, uh, I've been with her for 10 years. We met in high school. Wow. So like she, Cute. she kind of grew with me as, right, I was, right, right, right. as I'm building my career and is everything. She, is she so, in, the, in the industry as well? No, she's actually, she's an athletic trainer. So she balances right. out my crazy hectic schedule with a very stable income and job yeah. and schedule. <laughs> so I feel really lucky in that's that great. regard. That's great for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hold yeah, on, uh, dude. Hold has got a, he's got kids too, right? I don't, I don't even know if we talked. I know he's got a wife. I don't know if he has kids. I, I didn't ask him I, about I kids. I think he has kids. I don't know. Anyway. That is something that I'm trying to figure out because now that we're married, obviously kids is kind of like a conversation. It's like a yeah. hot topic right now. So how do we figure that out is like kind of the next stage of what we're trying to figure out now, honestly. Yeah, for sure. But you'll figure yeah. out. I got faith. You seem like you got to. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You're, you're putting it all together. Man. <laughs> yeah. Do you, I find that like. Being a DP and like, I guess just being in the film industry, you have to be like pretty selfish sometimes. And like to, in order to kind of grow and want to pursue this career, do you find that you have like a tendency to be selfish sometimes in, in balancing the relationships and jobs? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, like I said, man, just trying to find a balance. I think that there was like a period, and maybe this, I'm just at sort of a little bit of a, not a crossroads, but a inflection point a little bit, maybe like where I, I think when I was really in like my, in, at the end of film school and into my early 20s, when I was just like, I had a singular driving force and it was like, I want to be a full-time cinematographer. I want to make work I'm excited about and proud of and, and want to share. You know, when that was like the only thing driving me, it was, it was much, I think I was more selfish. I think I was making ex- decisions exclusively based on what was going to help further that pursuit because it felt like such an uphill battle that I just didn't even have the bandwidth to like, you know, mm. um, to, to do anything else. I remember at one point in college when I had, when I really was like, okay, I want to graduate school and like, cause I'd, I'd done some PAing at that time. Um, on, How long uh, ago was this, by the way? This is, I'm 29. I graduated uh, okay. school in, I graduated from SVA here in New York in. Um, Damn, you're 29, bro, bro. You're, you're working. Also, hold on. I'm just going to interrupt you and just say that like, you are probably one of the DPs that in my circle and like the people that I know, everyone looks at your work and is like, that is what I want to do. Oh, dude, man, that's so sweet. Thank you, bro. Sorry, sorry to interrupt that. you, but like, that's that, nice to hear. Like truly, uh, I'm going to get to this later, but there's a, you put out something with just you shooting sheep uh, on your Instagram yeah. and that, and, <laughs> yeah. and that sparked a short film that I did with the no director. Way. And it was the first time I actually ever shot on 16 mil by Sick, just watching dude. that thing. Yeah, well, it, ins- glad, it, in- it inspired me. But That's amazing. That's sorry so cool for that. Tan- yeah. Sorry for that tangent. But yeah. Tell me about your like film school days. Where did you go? And like, tell me about it. Um, yeah. So I went to, I moved to New York when I was, uh, so I grew up in LA. Um, and I didn't really, I always love movies. My parents have wonderful taste in films. So they, um, they, I think I, I, was introduced to some really good ones when I was young and I always really liked it, but I never really thought of filmmaking as like what I was interested in doing, I guess. Cause I used to skate and like bike and stuff. And I would, of course, and I would make videos (laughs) with my friends, but I was never, so I would, I would be the filmer a lot, you know, and I didn't really like it very much to be honest. And I was always like, this is my, my, I really like skating. I really like biking. I don't like being the filmer, you know? Mm. So I was always like, I just never really thought of that as like a, were you were you the worst skater of the group? Because I've heard <laughs> I've, I've heard that the worst skater is usually the one that's filming. That's that's usually the case. Yeah, I was I was <laughs> I think because I got into it later for whatever reason I was the I was the yeah probably so and I think maybe I still have a yeah I, I think I was for sure I hung out with some some kids who shredded pretty hard right. um, and uh, but but I think since then I still skate I, it's like one of my favorite things to do because. I don't know how this bodes for it's it's one of the few things I love watching movies. I love photography. Um, but those things like I still it's hard for me to turn off the part of my brain that like connects it back to like work and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but with skateboarding, like I literally just turn my brain off and like you just have to focus on what you're doing. So it's like the best. I, I really love it. It's very therapeutic, except for, you know, slamming face down on the concrete, right. which stops being therapeutic. <laughs> something. But anyway, I, 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 so now I still skate and I think now some part of me is like, yes, I'm better than Daniel was in high school. <laughs> you know right. I mean? like, yeah. <laughs> 10 years later or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, I was for sure. That that's definitely the case. And I didn't like it that much. And so when I went to school in New York, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to move to New York because I'd visited once when I was a teenager and really liked it. And, mm. um, and then during school, I sort of met um, somebody called, you know, Matthew Dillon Cohen. He's a director. Oh, of course. Yeah. MD, MDC. Insane. Also insane. from Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah insane. He's, uh, he's, Matt's like my best friend. And he got me into, we lived together in college and he started making these little music videos um, for like, whatever, you know, $1,000, $1,500 for friends of his who were musicians. He was just a hustler. And like, I guess in my mind at that point, there had always been, this is before I got into film school, there'd always been sort of a gap between real filmmaking and what, you know, I was ever able to do with a little camera with my friend skating or whatever, like, or like I used to make these like skip videos in high school a little Mm. bit. And like, it was just, they felt so amateur. And so like the gulf between that and real filmmaking was just huge. And then I saw Matt, like, I don't know, just have the confidence to be like, um, uh, why not? I can make a real film. You know, I'm, I can be responsible for somebody's thousands of dollars and get a red and shoot something on it, you know? And right. and they started making stuff that like looked really good. And some of it had some real like creative, the stuff he used to make for my friend Gus Dapperton. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. For yeah sure. Which is, which is all great. Like it had some really creative ways. It's, it's good work. It's still, I still love those videos. But anyway, that was the stuff that I saw and I was like, Oh my God, kids our age can like, you know, do this. And so then I decided that's what I wanted to do, switch into film school, which was at SVA. Um, okay. And I did that for two years. And then uh, I graduated 
there. But by the time I was like in my last year, I was like all respect to SVA and, and the professors and everything. I was checked out, dude. I yeah, was you really were tapped like, out. Yeah, I yeah. was like, I, I, I don't. Were I was, you working simultaneously at being in school? I started a little bit, but same thing sort of via Matt and via other friends who were like musicians and new musicians. I would shoot like little things here and there. Or mm. like my friend Luca Rapola, who doesn't, isn't a filmmaker anymore, had some, he would work with like some fashion brands and shoot little like content stuff. So like we would take a GH4 and like a, mm you know, go shoot some content stuff at their office or whatever. So there were like little things here and there. Um, I used to shoot events, you know, Matt projects. Not, I don't know Matt projects. No. Yeah. It's a production company agency okay. here in New York. Um, and I used to shoot events for them for a little while. So they would like give me their FS seven and I would go to like some fashion week party oh, nice. and, and do like a bunch of like shoot like celebrities and then like wh <laughs> whip in, whip out. They love the transitions. But so I would do that for like 300 bucks or something like that and then drop the shit back off at their office at the memory card. So I started doing all that and then some real job while I was still in school. And then, mm. and then I started getting, you know, a little bit more legit work and a little bit more legit work. And, and it goes from there. Interesting. So you were doing like the, the shooting with your skating, but you're doing these small things as well. Did you really, did you understand at that point what like the role of a real cinematographer was? I'm not sure I even understand now what the role of a real cinematographer is. <laughs> it's, it's a tough thing to define. I feel like I, I it, it's, um, I remember asking a friend of my dad's was a director, is a director, um, this dude, Michael Dinner. And uh, and I, I met him once. And I remember when I was just starting to get interested in film, I was like, he's a director. Uh, and I was like, what's um, I was like, what's the dif what's the difference between a director and a cinematographer? Like, what is the direct? What, where does where's the line between their two jobs? And he right. couldn't even really articulate. He's like, well, it depends. You know, sometimes I shot lists. Sometimes they'll shot lists if I'm working with the actor, you know, and like um, I just remember it always being kind of confusing. And I think now it's like. Um, it really depends on the collaboration, who you're working with, where your job ends and their job starts. And, and mm. some directors, like, I don't want to step on their toes and they're much, you know, they, they, they're looking for somebody who's just gonna, you know, sort of help facilitate what they want to do. And that's perfectly valid. I think I'm not exactly that kind of DP. I'm, I'm a little more of a, like a, try to be more of a partner for the director and, right, right. you know, what do you, what do you love most about your job as a DP? Like now compared to when you started, like, how has it changed as you've grown? Ah, dude, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I think, um, I think, man, there's a lot of things I really like about it. Uh, it's, 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 it's really. Personally, I think it's the best job in the entire world. That's yeah. like, it, I, I do. I love it so much. Like every time that I'm Tell working. Tell me what you, every, what you love about it. What's the, what's the thing? I think it's the collaboration of just one being with the director, but also just like working with crew, working with people that like one you're familiar with, you're comfortable with, you walk on set, you see the people that you like really like being around, you're smiling, yeah. you're having a good time. You, I, I tend to have this feeling of like an itch to problem, like solve things. So maybe I think the role of a DP helps in that because it's mostly problem solving, I think most of the job. And I just like, it's like visualizing something in my head and like trying to get as close as I possibly can in real life to what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, that's like yeah, a really yeah. satisfying feeling. Yeah, it, it, dude, it, it's, it's really satisfying. It could be really frustrating when you can't, I feel like I've been in that position where I have this image <laughs> yeah. and, and I just, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm tweaking all the lights and I'm putting fucking black wrap all over one of the lights. And I'm like, why can't I get this to look the way that I fucking want it? So it's, <laughs> I think because it can be so for me, at least because it can be so frustrating when it does work, it's that much more rewarding, mm. you know? Mm. Um, but I don't know, dude. I, I, I think that's all accurate, really um, resonate with all that. I think, I don't know, you know, it's, 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 in, it's a little bit ineffable. I think it's like something that, you know, you, you're on set sometimes and, and, and a shot works. There's some of that where like, you're really nervous about a shot and, and, and then it works and it's like the best feeling ever. Or like the light is just hitting the actor's face the right way. Or like, I've had right. things where like I've lit a stand in or just a PA and then like the, the actor, the model or whoever comes in and like, they look, it's just the. They, they look so good and like they're, they're, there's those moments where i'm like oh my god yes this is like i don't know but it's hard to it's hard to articulate it's just I like agree. A, it, it's like a little like um yeah like a butterfly in your stomach or something that like i get Completely. every every once in a while it's not always that like or sometimes i'll see an edit sometimes i'll like we'll shoot something i'll be like oh you know i'll feel whatever good about it pretty good about it but not and and then i'll get an edit back from a director i, I remember like walking on the street and getting an edit from my friend matt Vay fix who's a director i worked with of something i was sure was going to be shit <laughs> and he sent me and I was watching on my phone and I stopped on the street and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like we actually know what we're doing. Um, 
So I don't how know. Often it is that? How often do you find like you shoot a project in the edit and color or whatever is actually good compared to it not being good? Because <laughs> I'm at the, I feel like I'm at the stage in my career where maybe more than half is like this is questionable. I thought it was going to be better. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. It's, I know, and I know that feeling too, dude, it's really frustrating. That's one of the things that, that is tricky about being a DP, I think, is that you're so invested. Sometimes a blessing that you don't have to like, you know, you, you get right. to just walk away from set and be like, all right, until the color grade, like I, <laughs> I can move on. But like, sometimes it's, yeah, it's really frustrating that, you know, you, you think you've got all this amazing footage and then you hand it off and they, they go away for a little bit and you get an edit back and you're like, oh, this is... Right. There's, there's a for me at least sometimes I think there was something better in here and we didn't really um I didn't really get to that, you know mm. and sometimes that's and, and that's not always you know there's a lot of different voices involved obviously there's it with commercials especially music mm-hmm. videos there's a label commercials there's an agency and um and a client of course and all that so so, so there's many different factors at play um and that you know maybe that's one of the most amazing things about it too I've done a couple projects that like it's like it's like alchemy, you know, there's, there's, mm. you can go into every project and, 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 and the feeling of like understanding that some of whether this is going to be good or not is out of my hands. I, I can go into sure. everything with the best intention, but surrendering to that, you know, not trying to like keep your claws around it, but almost just like letting yourself sort of bob with the tide of, of that a little bit. Like, I, I feel like I've done projects that, um, we thought, you know, we're going to be, we're like, this is the one, this is going to be our opus, you know, me and like the, the rubber band guys, Simon and Jason, who, um, I work with all the Mm -hmm. time and I I love to death. And, um, but we've gone in together collectively, we've gone into some projects being like, this is going to be the one. And then for whatever reason, I don't know, sometimes it's the talent. Sometimes somebody's late. Sometimes it's the weather fucks us. Sometimes Mm. it's, you know, it's a, there's a million different things that are just, they're just frankly out of your hands, you know? And like, and, and so sometimes they don't turn out great. And there are other times when like I did this James Blake video, um, that is still one of my favorite things I've done. And like, we mm. had not nearly enough time and the celebrities schedules was so fucked. And like the location was kind of fucked up and it, it shouldn't have been good, but I don't know. God smiled upon us or the stars aligned in the right way. And like, it's amazing. It's so good. But like, you know what I'm saying? And it's again, just the recognition that like some of it is just up to the universe. And like, you mm. know, you, you could come into everything with the best intentions possible, but you do at a certain point have to kind of, you know, surrender, and like, like, let yeah, go a absolutely. little bit and, 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 and let it, you know, see if it, if it works or not. Right. Yeah. As you, as you, at this stage of where you are at the, as a DP compared to maybe when you were first starting, where it was like maybe less pressure, less scale crew, whatever, what is, what is something that you struggled with as you grew in scale and size? Was it like the leadership aspect? Was it management? Was it the just overall scope of everything? What were some things that maybe you had to learn about yourself that you struggled with initially? That's a good question. I, I think the hardest thing to learn, and I, I think this, um, I, I really admire directors and, and writers for this more than anything. It's just, you know, believing in your, in your ideas, being able mm. to like, to, to, to put your ideas out there and like, and, and feel, and, and ha- take them seriously. You know, I, I feel like, you know, the, the, the idea that like, I don't know, you know, you got to take yourself seriously, you got to take your ideas seriously. And then the people around you will take them seriously too, you know, but, but they, they we all put our ideas and our, our creativity out on the line for the people around us to, to judge and, and the audiences to judge and stuff. But I think, um, so, so I don't know, I guess I think that has been one of the biggest things is to, is to, you know, have confidence in your opinions about these things. And, then also have confidence that sometimes you don't have the answer. I don't know. I feel like I've done that mm-hmm. before too, where I've been on a scout and the gaffer's like, how do you want to light this? And like, I think I more recently, I've, I've just been more confident with that where I used to have to almost feel like I had to make something. If I didn't have the exact answer, I was like, oh, this dude's in his sixties, a union. He's been doing this for ages. He's worked with all these right. amazing people. Like, I don't want him to think I'm a little boy. Um, <laughs> so I would just say something, but now I'm much more confident in being like, you know, man, I, I don't know. I'm not sure this space mm. isn't looking exactly like I wanted it to. Like I'm gonna have to give it some more thought, you know? Mm. So um, it's kind of like letting go of certain control in a way and allowing for like some uh, more c- uh, collaboration between each other. I think that there's some of that. And I think that there's some like, again, just sort of, I don't know, honesty, just, 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 just being honest about it. I think honest, honestly, like this is sort of what, what makes it, I think my relationship with some directors really amazing. And with others, it's not, although well, I haven't had too many of those, but like, you know, there's, I, I'm just, I'm pretty honest. I'm pretty frank about stuff. If I think something mm-hmm. isn't going to work or doesn't work, or I don't like the way that a space looks or whatever. I'm, I try to be honest about all that stuff and not like sugarcoat it to not right. hurt anybody's feelings. And I think, um, that's really valuable. So again, being confident in your opinions and, and all that stuff, 
is good. But ultimately, man, dude, having having the resources, having a bigger crew and stuff, like it, it really sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating when you know you want to just improvise and pan the camera left and there's like a crafty setup right there or something like, like when you have the whole like big machine yeah but also like it does make it easier i mean having a big crew and having it's it's the most working with gaffers who like you know you've never done a big night exterior before i remember doing this where we had like a condor and i was so nervous i was like oh my god i've never what if this light isn't powerful enough what mm. if it, we need more fill all this stuff but then you go on the scout and this gaffer you know has has, has done this a million times and he's like i don't worry you put this light up there at that distance it'll work so like having the the knowledge of these right. people around you with the with That's the amazing. experience being able to trust in that lean on that but also don't let it overpower you you know because because you know you may not want you, you may have gotten there because you have a certain naturalistic style that these guys aren't used to working in and like so just trying to find that balance again like everything mm. you know did you ever feel intimidated the first time you worked with like a gaffer or a key grip or someone that you thought was like really above where you were? Yeah, for sure. For sure, man. Yeah. hundred percent. But again, I think, you know, you, 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 it's, if you're a good, if you're a good person, you're kind and, and you're, and you're honest again about mm -hmm. sort of where you're at and what you're interested in and everything like, um, it can be really amazing, you know? And I think people, mm -hmm. people, even older people I've, I've worked with who've, who've, you know, I have a lot of experience. I think that they really respect that too. I think, I think everybody respects that, you know, it's, there's a, that, that kind of openness and honesty of being like, Hey, I haven't done a lot of night exteriors like this. Right. I really want it to look like this. I don't want it to look too Hollywood. I don't want it to be overlit. Um, and my thought was to put a 360 up on the crane right there, but I don't know if it's going to be enough output. You're just being honest. You don't have to. And, and, and then they'll tell you, you know, like, well, you know, normally we do it like this, but like, if you don't want it to, you know what I'm saying? It's right. Yeah. I don't know. That kind of candid, candidness point. is for, for me tra has, has transparency used. about for what sure. you know and what you don't know. For sure, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think something that like I'm where I currently am in my sta the stage in my career. I feel like I'm like one step at the next level, and the other foot kind of where I've been for a while. And I've struggled in, in, with... In what sense? What are those two levels? So I think it's... And that's, that's something I talked to Olan about too. It was like, I, maybe it's like a lack of... Uh, do I work... Am, am I limited in like the directors that I'm working with? How do I find directors that want to push themselves creatively? How do I find projects that are creatively fulfilling? But then I also ask myself, how many of these projects that I look at that are amazing does the DP receive the treatment and is amazing off the bat or are they the one to then add their own flavor to make it amazing? So is it, is it my own lack of, you know, additional creative thought and, you know, doing something <laughs> that's maybe limiting my project or limiting the, the growth of my own career in a way. I know that was like a, a ramble. No, it's no. kind of just like my own no, thoughts. I've been there. rambling this whole time. Dude. Don't yeah, worry about it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, dude, that's, that's a really, that's a really good question. I think I've had similar feelings about a lot of these things too. I think um, ultimately like, yeah, it, it is tough to, it's, it's tough to put a blanket solution to that over everything. You know, it's like every, every relationship, every project is different. And again, some directors, like I might personally read a treatment and think, Oh, I think we can make it better if we, with X, Y, and Z. And then like, it's not my, you know, sometimes I get sort of rebuffed. It's not my place to tell them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like also there's other cases where I think directors are really like open and malleable and like you're able to, you know, they, they came to you because they really want your opinion on these things, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you can really um, help sh sh shift the project in the direction you want it to go. Um, but at the same time, I think, I don't know, maybe it's Scorsese. Somebody said you can't make a good, you've heard this before, you can't make a good film out of a bad script, but you right. can't make a bad film out of a good script, you know? Mm -hmm. I think ultimately like, if the creative isn't good, you can polish it as much as you want, but like, right. it's not going to, you know what I mean? Exactly. That, that always has to be the strongest thing. I'd mm -hmm. like, yeah. Anyway, it's a, uh, yeah. Do you think that your, you find that your, your growth has kind of been based on the, your own curation of the work that you said yes or no to, or do you think there's kind of luck involved? Do you think that you've, there's been just like right place, right time? Like how could you kind of maybe look back at your career and be like, I, Maybe a lot of this was my own doing. Maybe, maybe not at all. I, I did kind of what I said earlier. I mean, there's a certain amount of like, it is luck. It is mm. the, oh my God, today's 9-11, huh? That's crazy. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, shit. Yeah. Um, I was actually just thinking about the, 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 and I don't know, I don't want this to be inappropriate. The, the Strokes first album, Is This It? Um, mm. Is, uh, I don't know if you're a fan. I love, I think it's like one of the best albums of the last 
many decades. And it, it's it's really good, but it got elevated to this level beyond probably what it deserves because it came out right after 9-11. Oh, wow. And they were this really New York band that really like it was all about like it had the feeling and energy of like New York that, that hadn't really been present since like the Velvet Underground. And so they they this came out and the whole world wanted to root for New York. And here comes this band that is so New York, you know, and like it made this album into this like iconic piece of, you know, yeah. uh, turning point in indie music and everything. So I think that there's uh, a certain amount of like, yeah, dude, it's, it's just, it's just Matt, you know, in, in friends of mine's careers, mm. they've done music videos for artists who like then made a huge hit song. And so like they took it with them, you know, or like Matt, Matt, my friend, Matt Cohen and making videos for Gus Dapperton or, um, you know, my friend Kevin Lombardo and making videos for Omar Apollo. And like at the same time, that these artists were on the rise, they were on the rise. So I think there's a lot of it that is out of your hands. But mm -hmm. I think, again, you go into everything with the best intentions and, yeah. um, you know, trying to just put the, the creative first. But the the yeah, I don't know that, the, you know, if you take that forward, like some things are going to work and some things aren't going to work and a certain amount of it is just out of your hands. Not to say you don't have agency ever, you know, I mean, right. I think with my own career, I've I've been active in trying to like. You know, I, I uh, especially in the past would shoot commercials that I, I weren't really the aesthetic that I am interested in or excited about. They were wonderful learning experiences and, and got to meet cool directors or go to a cool place and shoot with cool people or whatever, try a different technique. Um, but if it's not something that I am interested in making more of and exploring more, I don't share it. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't even if it's this big, hot commercial for an airline or something sure. like, like I don't if it's not <laughs> if it's not a, if it's not aesthetically something that I'm interested in exploring mm -hmm. more. And I don't therefore want to be hit up to shoot more like that. You know, I don't uh, I don't, you know, uh, what percentage of the work I try to curate the stuff I shared to be yeah. the stuff that I'm interested in and want to make more of, you know, what percentage of the work that you do, do you feel that you don't want to share versus what you want to share because i think to go back for me i feel like what i don't share is almost maybe like 75 percent of the work that i do yeah. versus the 25 percent or whatever that i do share that i'm really proud of yeah um i i think that that's not a bad ratio <laughs> i think it could, it could be a lot worse than that you know mm. what you say 25 percent is I mean maybe I'm being generous maybe it's even like fifteen <laughs> maybe it's fifteen percent of okay. the thing that I'm really proud of I guess all right okay I feel that I feel that for sure I think that that um, I've found in the last couple of years at least as I've been lucky enough to be you know pretty busy and and being hit up to work with with good directors and stuff I felt a little bit I felt the percentage has been higher than that you know there's been more things that I've been excited about sharing mm. but but a couple of years ago too for sure same thing with me man I would do a lot of stuff that like you know. I think I think part of playing the game or being smart about it in this era, especially with Instagram being as prevalent as it is, is even if it's a project you're not stoked about, if you can find a few images right. from it that you're proud of and excited about and like mm. share those, um, that's really valuable. I think also like, yeah, I, there's not really any rules, you know, I, I don't. Mm. I, so with that stuff, and I'm often reminded of that, I, a friend of mine who shall not be named um, <laughs> to help transition from music videos into commercials, the director transition from music videos into commercials, because he would do, he, 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 he's got a really good mind for this stuff. And he would do music videos that, um, for big artists that weren't cool, but he would find a way to sort of manipulate the footage into a spec commercial. So uh, he would like awesome. specifically have all the, the talent wear Adidas in it so that he could then make an Adidas spec. And it worked. <laughs> perfect, like perfectly. He totally got into commercials after that. And to, to the point that even he mentioned it to an EP, this Adidas commercial, and the EP's like, yeah, we saw the brief on that. And he's like, no, you didn't. This is a real commercial. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Saw, we saw the brief on that and we decided not to do it. It's like, no, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think like, you know, th that's one version of it, but even like, again, you know, being able to pull good images out of a project that may not be that good. And, and, and that's what you share and you're just vague about it. And like, I don't know, maybe it sounds a little schemey, but like, I think, um, no, I think that's fair. Yeah. 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 I think that mm. for, for me has, has, has been, uh, I don't know, a way that at least if not for the clout or whatever, like at least like I can salvage to myself, I spent this much time on this project. At least there's something that I'm happy about at the end of it. And right. I'm, I'm excited to share, you know, do you use social media in like a positive way of sort of like marketing yourself? Because it doesn't seem like you're a big, I mean, I could be wrong, like a big social media presence person. Like you post every so often, maybe you 
Oh, you Barely. haven't seen my OnlyFans? No, that's that. I'm oh, acting man, I, I, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to share that one. I'll pay for it. <laughs> I'm gonna put that. Let's put that in the description. <laughs> yeah, link, for dude. sure. How much do you charge per month? Yeah, oh, dude, you don't want to know. <laughs> but are you? Do you find it to be valuable for you in your career? Are you like connecting with people, networking, or, or is it just kind of like every so often I'll go on and share some stills and then call it a day? Yeah, I'm. I'm again, maybe less of late, but um, just because I've been, I don't know. I think uh, Instagram. Yeah, I think I'm. I'm. I think it's been really important for me, for better or for mm. worse. Like in the past, I think I've. I've people have found my work, and I've found people's work um, through through Instagram, uh, and been able to connect and and just become inspired and, and and see work and see photographers and stuff I never would have seen otherwise. So I think that it's it has served and continues to serve an important. And, and Vimeo too. I mean, Vimeo, especially a couple uh, yeah. of years ago, you know, is, 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 has been super important. So yeah, I think I have a pretty positive relationship with it as a consumer. What what I share on there and stuff. Again, I try to do the same thing. I try to make it just shit I'm I'm stoked about. I try not to be too calculating about it, and I try not to um, sweat it too much. You know, if this thing right. doesn't get as many likes as I want or whatever, it's it's uh, as long as I'm psyched about it. You know? Do you still find like inspiration from Vimeo? Do you do you ever just go on there and just sit yeah. for a? What yeah. is your, I'm curious about what your, do you have a technique for Vimeo? Because I feel like I have like a very specific way that what, I what sit do you down mean? and watch. Like people ask me, like I can never find anything good on Vimeo. And the way that I do it is like, say for example, I'll go on your page. I'll go under what you like yeah, and that's find it. a video. That's it. Same and same I'll movie. go under what that person likes. Yep. And literally by the time I'm literally at like the center core of Vimeo. <laughs> You've gone back to the, to the, <laughs> the, original, the original big bang of Vimeo. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, dude, that's exactly the same thing. And, and that's the same thing. But this is, yeah, this is also the same thing. People who are naysayers of Vimeo, Instagram, whatever, like I, I think, um, I think that they're, uh, I think it's silly because that's the, what we're describing right now. It's the slightly it's translated onto the internet age, but that's exact. I heard an interview with PTA in the nineties where he's talking about how he got started as a director. And he said, I love Scorsese. I love Jonathan Demi. So mm-hmm. I went and looked at what films they love in interviews right. and I watched those films. And then I went and looked at what those filmmakers like. And I watched those, you know what I mean? It's the exact same thing we're describing. It's just the bite-sized version of it, you know? Absolutely. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think that that's a, a super. That's the fucking best way to do it for sure. Hundred sure. uh, percent. Something I was curious about. It's maybe a little technical. Is I just started learning how to shoot film for yes. the first time. Good for you. We I didn't go it. to. I didn't go to film school, so I grew up, you know, digital. And like yeah. I said before, that one scene that you shot of the sheep inspired me to like I'm glad, just man. That's so go cool. out, go out and do it. Um, and obviously, um, the most basic form shooting a Bolex, you know. 250D, 500T. How did you kind of learn to shoot film and how did you start to evolve your knowledge within film to like maybe ectochrome or different different stocks, different types yeah. of cameras? Yeah, ectochrome's a little, it's a tricky one. I, I heard ju- it's uh, insane. I heard it's, it's, it's tough. Just, it's just a really, it's not a lot of latitude. I just right. shot something on ectochrome. Uh, which looks dope. I'm stoked on it. But like, there's a couple shots in there. I was like, oh my God. This is- I, I was watching something that you, sh- uh, I'm on your, your website here. Is it? Oh yeah, the Zara Kids Spring Twenty Three was shot on Ectochrome. Yes, that's that's that a, that's is a, crazy. Yeah, dude, man. So I told you we got lucky too, man. We got good weather that day, and like we we didn't we got terrible weather. It was pouring rain, but then like the couple scenes we had outside, like that beautiful shot of the girl on the bike at the end. Yeah. That's just an act. It's a happy accident that that's as, as beautiful as it is. You know, like we were riding right at the bottom edge of what Ectochrome could expose. You know, and I was a little nervous about it, and like it had been this in L.A. too, this terrible rainy day all day, and then the sun came out just at the end, and we got this kind of golden thing over the hill there, and wow. like, yeah, it it was we didn't, you know, it's it's again, it's that that's the beauty of it. It's alchemy, mm-hmm. man. It's like you can't you can't manufacture some of that that amazing stuff, which is what makes it so. Yeah, what makes it so so but when you when you can get your hands wrapped around it, you know, just for a second, or when when you can, yeah, it's like it's the best. I don't even know what the it is I'm describing, but you understand that feeling, right? Um, it's so special. I I um shooting on film, shooting Ectochrome, yeah, dude. It's uh it's been a it's been a process. I think part of what what I've been so lucky to do is the first couple of things that I did, um music videos and stuff, I really made an active effort to shoot on 16 at the time. Mm. I, I think I honestly kind of learned a lot shooting on film before I'd even shot, worked with an Alexa or an Amir or anything mm. that much. Were these Bolexes or were these like SR3s? What were you no, starting with? So, so it was at my film school, they had SR2s. At oh, SVA, they had, they were just collecting dust in the closet. Which oh, nice. Bust them out of there, knock the dust off, <laughs> knock the cobwebs <laughs> off. And, um, 
And uh, SR2s, and then a friend of mine, Kenny Sewell, who's also a wonderful DP, owned a 416. He would let me borrow sometimes to shoot little like music videos for friends mm-hmm. and stuff. So I think I recognized at that point too that, and I was able to. My my professor at film school had a closet full of just rolls of 16 that he got from oh, school. Man. So I would beg him for, but he wouldn't give. They were supposed to be for school projects, so I'd be like, "Hey, I'm kind of doing this school project." <laughs> and he'd be like, "All right," and he'd give me a couple rolls of 50D or whatever. Um, so you kind of finessed it together. I made friends with the guys at Metropolis Post here in New York. God bless them, who like uh, you know would help me with deals and stuff. Uh, that's I who young. I got my uh, film scanned by. Jack, did you talk to Jack? Uh, I don't. I don't. To be honest, I don't even okay, think I talked okay. to anybody. I just dropped it off. You get, if you get a chance to talk to Jack Rizzo, anybody yeah. listening to this, if you get a chance to talk to Jack Rizzo at Metropolis Post, it's always a treat. This guy's this man's a real a real legend and a real New Yorker. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, but he. Uh, but anyway. The the you know I think um, I made an effort to shoot on sixteen because I, I think at the time too I was it, it was it was at a period where it, think the really popular aesthetic was uh, I don't I don't know if you remember this because you're a couple years younger than me but it was it was like really wacky old anamorphics like Lomos and Kawas um, on on an Alexa Mini with an Easy Rig and like everybody everybody my age everybody my, all my peers <laughs> were doing this like docu style and i did some of that too but doing this mm-hmm. like docu style branded content um where they would shoot like that the whole thing like it would just be mm-hmm. like aiming like a lomo at the sun with somebody's head right. in between and like you know um was this like maybe five years ago or was this before that it's like 2016 2017 2018 probably oh, okay I mean, so a little bit maybe like eight years nine years ago yeah give or yeah. take yeah yeah exactly fuck is it it's crazy it is yeah, yeah it's crazy <laughs> i know but so I wasn't that excited by that, and I liked um, I liked film, and it felt like it was sort of a anti, sort of like a, um, you know, the opposite of what was cool at that moment. And then I started shooting a bunch of sixteen, and right as I did that, like sixteen started to become that mm. aesthetic started to become really popular again. And you started seeing like, you know, all these big fashion brands post stuff where like it'll cut to like a bolex where you could see the the open gate and you see the mm. perfs and stuff. Um, so like that aesthetic became popular. So I think. Anyway, I don't know. I've gotten off the question. What, what, That's the, okay. The, it's just kind of like how have you kind of learned to evolve your knowledge and style shooting film? Because it could be very simple just to shoot like 250D or 500T with a Bolex. But as you get to different cameras, even 35 mil, how have you even learned to do that? Like how yeah. have you learned? Was it just well, 35, your own? 35 and 16 are the same. It's the same mm. thing. It's I mean, there's there's. The, the way you expose it and all that right. stuff, the way you lens it, it's that that's the same. It's it's sixty five is the same. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's all the same. It's about the emulsion and everything. How did I evolve it? Practice, you know. Right. Um, I, I think I started through uh, passion projects or through like legitimate work. A little, a little bit of a little both. bit of both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but 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 again, okay. This is what I was gonna say, was saying is that that uh, early on we didn't have any money, we couldn't light anything, you know that kind of thing. And I always thought like, oh, film brings so much life and texture to it. Um, that if you can't light, you're just using natural light and all that stuff. Film kind of, you know, gives it a look that um, that that felt like it was sort of a solution to some of the like, you know, uh, I feel that. the lack of resources that we had elsewhere. Mm. So that's where we would put the resources for just for for small music videos, that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, man, that's just how it happens. And and you work with directors too, who like, you know, I, I know there are some directors who they they have a hard time pitching film. But then there's some directors who only, you know, like like the rubber band guys, Simon and Jason, my friends, like that's in every treatment. And like basically everything they do is kind of like it's just assumed they're going to shoot on film. So like I've been lucky with that, too, you know, to get to work with directors who really value shooting on film and and, and push that forward. Um, And and learning to learning to yeah, learning to shoot all different stocks again, just practice, man, you know, realizing it's figuring out how lighting ratios work, figuring out how you know, different lenses are going to, are going to veil and backlight or how much they're going to hold down the shadows when you shoot a light into the lens or look at a mm. window or whatever, because that's stuff that on digital, you can see right away on the monitor, but on film, um, you know, you got to wait a couple of days to figure out whether or not you can actually see yeah, something face with the window in front of them or whatever that, that kind of stuff. So all that. And then, and then, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, that's been the, the biggest thing. Um, I, I have a note in my phone that I started years ago where I, I take down exposures on set mm. when I have time, if there's a shot that I really like the look of, or that I'm having that question where I'm like, Oh my God, is this going to work? Or is it going to be way, way too not enough fill or whatever it is, you know, that I'll, I'll take a, I'll, I'll write down notes on it. And then when I get the footage back, I'll compare it to, to the notes and be like, Interesting. Oh shit, I underexposed this too much. Or, you know what I mean? Um, Interesting. That's so, a good so keeping, idea. yeah, keeping some kind of log of it when you can on, obviously there's not mm. always time is, is really useful. Um, yeah, just experience. Mm. I guess like, 
you, you sparked a question like you take a note, you look at the footage back and you kind of compare. Besides that, do you have any sort of like post shoot reflection type of approach? Like, do you ever think about how you could have done something better? Like, is there any sort of that after you wrap a project? Um, yeah, man, that, that's, that's super important. I think in, in film and in life, you know, to mm. take it, taking a little time to look back at something, slowing down for a second and reviewing, uh, for sure. I have, uh, <laughs> another note in my phone called, that's just called things I've learned. And mm. I, I just write after every shoot. And sometimes there aren't, sometimes there aren't like big notes that I take away, but I'll just write like, sometimes it's about exposure. Sometimes it's about, oh fuck, like I shouldn't have pushed for Dolly on this. We didn't have time. It should have been steady camp. You know what I mean? Right. Things like that. Or like, about how you rehearse or whatever, just anything I've learned on that shoot. And the, the note by this point is like, as long as, you know, it's, it's, it's very long. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I do that too, which is, which is really helpful. Mm. I think it's really important to be able to reflect and see what worked, what didn't work, 100%. why it didn't work, you know, all that stuff. Mm. On the business side of things, do you find that you are business minded as a, as a cinematographer? Cause some people own, a crap load of gear and use that for rentals. And then some people don't even own a camera at all. No, 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 yeah, no, 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 not, not like that for sure. I, I've always tried to put the, you know, the money follows uh, creative, you know, I've, I've always just tried to, to jump on things I'm excited about or whatever. Sometimes people ask like, what's your rate? Not, not like producers, but like just people, I don't know, people, uninitiated people are like, right. what's your rate? And I'm like, I don't have a rate. My rates, whatever the project can afford. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not, there might be something my agent says, but like, I'm down to do something. I, I do shit for free all the time. If like, it's for something sure. I'm, I'm psyched about the creative, you know, mm. um, which, I, which I think is important too. I know DPs who've got, gotten kind of lost in the commercial world once they start seeing those big dollar signs and the, and the first class flights and all that stuff. And I think like, <laughs> yeah. if you can restrain yourself, it's, um, it's, it's more rewarding, but also I think ultimately it helps your career too. You know, if you put the creative first and, and the money will come naturally after that, you know? Mm. Um, and I don't know, I own, I own two 16 millimeter cameras and, and I've never, I don't ever think I've made a cent off of renting them to anybody. They're just, I just want to shoot on film. So right. I bought these film cameras, you know? I love that. Yeah. Mm. So going back to like, um, what I was saying earlier about where I feel like I'm kind of stuck, I think. I don't know if this is something that I should even be wanting to think about or consider is getting an agent because I'm not, I'm currently not repped at all, but I feel that I'm getting close to the stage of maybe I should be represented. How did you go about getting an agent? Did you find it? Did you reach out today or do you, did you find, do you find it valuable? Like, what do you find valuable about it? Um, I, I, yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think that if you're, if you're the reason you want to get an agent is that like, I'm, and I'm not saying this is you at all, but I've heard this from a lot of people. That's just like, I want them to get me work. Um, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of times, especially in the age of social media and stuff, you got to be your own proponent, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, your work and your reputation and, and how you present yourself will be the best version of that, you know, to, to get you work. But I think the agent to me, uh, especially my, my agent, Aaron Randall at CAHS, Aaron, um, the best, Shout out Aaron. Lo love her to death. She's number one. <laughs> um, she, she and I have been together now for like five years or something like that. And she's, um, she's like a backstop, you know, she's like, I, 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 I trust her taste. And so I like ask her, what do you think about, should I do this? Should I do that? Is it worth doing this project? If we're going to miss out on that project or should I leave the time open because other stuff is going on? You know what I mean? I really, in terms of helping you sort of guide your career and, 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 yeah. and, and, and having that, being able to make those, those calls and give that advice from a place of, she works with all these other amazing DPs. She works with amazing production designers and stylists. And, and she, you know, she's got a deeper depth of knowledge of how people's careers kind of evolve and grow than I do. Same with the features agents. All those people have been super useful um, right. to talk to about, you know, how, how, what kind of projects to jump on and which to avoid, you know, it's sort of the like it can be a kind of acidic part of of the the work you know you really just want it to be about the creative but like mm -hmm. sometimes unfortunately it has to be about playing the game of like you know playing that game a little bit the career game but um but but I, I found the agenting thing really useful because of what I just described and less so because you know again I'm just like emailing them like where's the where's the work where's the jobs yeah, exactly. send me some send me some jobs um, I, th I yeah. think what you said is kind of the reason why I feel like maybe I want. Maybe someone is, I, I did a feature about two years ago and it did pretty well. And then I got sent maybe Congratulations, like, man. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, like maybe five to seven different feature scripts over the course of the 
the past two years, all of them I've turned down, but it was hard for me to like really decide, like, is this, the, should I be saying yes to this? Should I be saying no? Why am I feeling a certain way? Is it, is it the budget? Is it the script? Is it the director? I just felt like I had nobody to really like talk to about that stuff besides maybe some other DPs. Yeah, dude, I, th that's exactly what you're describing is exactly what having an agent can be really, really helpful with. Um, I, I think that that's, yeah, I think that that's the best reason to, to get one is, is for help with that kind of stuff. Again, helping sort of, you know, guide yeah. your, your career and the direction you want to take it in or, or be able to advise on, on the decisions that you should make in that respect, you know, um, mm. Hopefully, I think super, I mean, super it'll useful. come one day, it'll, it'll eventually come one day. For sure. I mean, dude, I don't, there's no, there's no shame in like reaching out to people. I think that that's fully valid mm -hmm. too, you know? Um, but, uh, but also, yeah, I don't know. I think somebody just tracked down my shit off of me. It was a friend of a friend. The first, my first agent, AJ, um, that was a connection through somebody else. Yeah. But, but, but dude, reaching out is fully valid too. I don't right. know. But if you feel mm -hmm. like, if you feel like it's time and you're ready, I'll tell you what yeah. I've never regretted. Sometimes people are like, Oh, is it worth the 10% of your, of your, of your rate? Yes. 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 <laughs> I have never, ever regretted the 10% of my rate. They do, yeah, yeah, yeah. they do more than enough to like, for me to not feel fully, you know, that's yeah. right. I love that. Mm. All right. So I guess stepping away from the business side, something that I am also trying to learn is how to find different inspiration other than just looking at like shot deck or frame set yeah. and looking at other DPs work. How do you find other inspiration or other mediums to kind of influence your art? That's a, that's a, a wonderful question. And something I've, I've thought about a lot the last couple of years, um, because I think sometimes it can start to be a little bit of this echo chamber, it's you know, redundant. I feel like you start seeing other DPs work, then you're like, Oh, I'm going to create my own, but it's kind of the same because you're mm -hmm. influenced by it. Yeah, that. for sure. I think especially when it's coming from, I don't know if there's like a, a date past which, like if you look at something old enough, now it's fair game to like, mm. ape, ape, you know what I mean? But like the, um, the new, yeah, especially when you're, if like all you're consuming is Vimeo and Instagram, like it's just going to be the same regurgitated <laughs> stuff. And um, yeah, so, so um, I've been. Yeah. I mean, dude, the obvious answers are like, you know, photography, photo books, photo exhibits, like that stuff is, is, is really a wonderful inspiration. I've mm -hmm. found to be a wonderful inspiration looking at older films, doing what we discussed before, which is like, you know, I love Paul Thomas Anderson. Who does Paul Thomas Anderson love? And who does that director love? And where do they get inspired? You know, um, is also really amazing, but I, I've, I've really found in the last couple of years and here's me like stepping into, you know, a place that's a little pretentious. Um, yes, sir, I love it. Forgive me. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've found architecture has been a really big inspiration for me in, in cinematography. Um, I kind of got a fascination with it right about just before COVID and like over COVID when we were all just sort of cooped up, I spent a lot of time, I bought architecture books and I was, I was reading a lot about um, a handful of architects that I was really interested in and, and their work. And then when things opened back up, I was able to, on different travel jobs, go visit some of these places. Um, and oh, that's awesome. Yeah, dude, it's amazing. It's like a scavenger hunt. Anytime I go mm. anywhere, anywhere in the U.S., any city <laughs> I shoot in, I look up Frank Lloyd Wright houses or buildings near this city. And then like, I'll take a day, rent a car and go drive out to look at this thing. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. But dude, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really inspiring. There's the literal sort of connection, which is like how architecture uses lead lines and light and structure mm. to frame certain spaces and stuff. And then, um, you know, there's all that, but there's the philosophical side of it too, that like the way that I think right specifically, or, or, um, some of the modernists, like, you know, Mies van der Rohe, uh, approached architecture, the philosophy that they brought to it is so different. And so, you know, trying to sort of take inspiration from places like that is, is really useful. I, I'll give you one example of, of it, to make sense of it. Frank Lloyd Wright, who's the one that I really like, you could probably tell, um, is, uh, <laughs> did something with a lot of his houses that he called compression and release. So when you mm. go into a building, he wanted to give it the feeling of you, you would go into his buildings and it's a really tight space. The entry area was always really tight and, and a little oppressive. And then when you walked out into the living room, the main area, whatever it was, it was like stepping outside. So you were coming inside, but because he had compressed you into the space, when you came out of it, it was like a breath of fresh air wow. walking into the living room. You know what I mean? Or, or whatever mm. the, the space was, the main hallway, the, the workspace, whatever building it was. Um, but translating that into film, the idea of like, you know, using darkness and silhouette at a moment before you release when somebody's walking down a hallway, you know, instead of it just mm. being lit the whole hallway, it's like it's dark the hallway. Going in and you out of light. Exactly. But to, that diversity, but also, again, sort of forcing the audience down into this little space and then letting them open up into something else, you know? Oh, I love um, that. 
Yeah, I think that's, that's one, and that's one example. There's so much, and there's no, so much there. You know, I appreciate you saying that because sometimes I hear people talk about their influences of like photo books, and I'm like, how does this translate to art? I feel like you're just talking like out in the abyss, but like you just said something very practical <laughs> yes. that yes. actually made sense to me. That, that's that's the literal translation. Again, there there is the more sort of nebulous like um, philosophical stuff about about form versus function and all that. Um, but, um, but there's also, yeah, some literal like one-to-one stuff that's pretty, that's, that's, I found really exciting, um, mm. and inspiring, you know, to be able to pull from those different places and, and, and refreshing, you know, cause again, I think you could get bogged down and just sort of regurgitating the same shit over and over and, and it's not so fun. Right. What about your work right now? If you go look at it, that you find you're trying to maybe evolve into like, what is something new that you're trying to work your work yourself into within your work if that makes sense it's a really good question i'm i'm um i mean narrative is a direction that i'm I'm trying to go in at the moment um mm. uh but um and i, I shot a, a movie this year which i'm stoked about um a feature a feature yes amazing first, first Congrats. One. yeah it was cool sweet how yeah, was yeah, it yeah. uh tough it's brutal, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it was really rough man indies are indies are tough it was also really um we shot in in Texas and Tennessee uh, in the, the earlier this summer, and it was like so hot, and oh, it was man. really physical. It was a lot of handheld, so like I was just just a taxing experience, you know, tight schedule, tight prep. Um, but uh, but I'm very excited to see it, I, I'm, or a cut at least, and and mm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. It was a really amazing experience in in many ways. Um, but so narrative and, and all that, but also, man, it's a good question. I, I really I, I don't know. I'm not sure if I have like that clear of an answer for it. Um, I'm I'm trying to do. Trying to take projects I'm excited about for one reason or another. I'm trying to work with directors that I admire and that and that not only do I think, you know, uh, people I can learn something from, I I think has been, I don't know, trying to trying to uh, tone down my own ego a little bit or whatever, but a little bit. But like, I I think um, I I think trying to take projects that that are challenging, but also, again, people that I think, you know, I'll grow as a filmmaker with whether that's a commercial music video, whatever it is. Um, stepping outside of my comfort zone a little bit. Mm. Um, and again, just listening, you know, th- doing that a little bit more. I think I can be a little bit bullish sometimes or have been in the past about about things that I think are right, what the right way to shoot something is or whatever. And sometimes I find this with the rubber band guys a lot um, who, again, I mm-hmm. – dear friends and collaborators. But, you know, it's, we'll, we'll sometimes have different opinions about how to approach something and we'll end up doing their thing. And in the moment, I'm like, oh, this is not the way, right way to do this. And then I'll I'll, I'll watch it later and I'm like – yeah, they were right. That was, I had the right. wrong idea. They had the right way to do it. You know what I mean? I, like, mm. It's a little humbling, but also like, again, trying to find more of that where I can, you know, where I can grow, where I can listen, where I can, what I can absorb mm. and, and, and learn from the people I'm working with. Um, I think that's something going forward that I'm, I'm excited about, you know? Mm. I don't know if you could answer this, but like what you just said, like you maybe disagree with the director on something. You end up going with what they want and then you in the moment are like, ah, oh, maybe this isn't the right thing. When you're on set, how do you sometimes let go of that kind of annoyance or like how do you not show that because sometimes i feel like i struggle with like maybe i'm showing my frustration a little bit yeah i mean i think uh, that's really tough sometimes it, it is dude for sure for sure um xanax no, oh man <laughs> <laughs> so all, you take one of those and all your problems go away. all your problems are done yeah yeah yeah. no but i'm joking about that dr- no 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 not nobody you know be taking drugs don't on do that but kids the, yeah, don't, yeah kids stay away um <laughs> the um no it's um it's a good question, man. It's tough. It can be tough for sure. Everything is really tense on set. It's really charged. You have a tight schedule in the ADs behind you, looming over your shoulder. Like, we got to go yeah, right now. The, the jeopardy. down your neck. Dude, you literally feel like you're on jeopardy. It's like, man, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. every second you're trying to light or tweak something. Um, it can be really difficult to be calm in those situations, but it's really, really important to, I think, really important mm. to. Not, not just for you, for the people around you, for the relationships, but for more than anything, for the actors, man, for the people on camera. Like, for, I, I the, you could have the most beautiful shot ever, and if the performance, whatever's happening on camera, isn't good, and it's not gonna be if they feel like this rattly, terrible anxiety all around them, and then they're like, "All right, go act now," you know? Right. Um, it's super, super important. So I think, however you can do that, whatever you know, whatever way you can sort of try to in- internalize that stuff. I go to therapy. Mm. That that's been really helpful for me. You know? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah I, I love for many things. You know, for I think it's good for everybody to to see mm. a therapist. But I think it's made me a little bit more calmer, a, l- a little bit calmer mm. than perhaps I was as a teenager or younger younger man. Um, but yeah, have it's, you studied it, any sort of like psychology or theology or any sort of like stoicism type of uh, practices at all? 
I have not beyond again my discussions with my with my therapist. I'm interested in in like um Carl Jung a little bit that kind of thing, but not really mm-hmm. what you what you what you're describing. No, right. I know some people do. I feel like yeah, I, I know DPs who are like Zen monks, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Which is I, uh, which is impressive. I, I I chatted with what's his name Eric Koretz. He did season four of Ozark, and oh, he sick. was saying how important like human psychology was it was for him and how important stoicism was for him and meditation yeah and bre- breathing exercises and for him that's like the key to being calm dude a hundred percent i think whatever whatever works for you for, for that person i i you know i don't drink too much coffee i feel like that could be enough for so you know it's um <laughs> it's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be case by case with everybody but um but I think remaining equanimity is the word, you know, remaining calm in, in, in situations of pressure and stress mm. um, is really, really important for yourself and for the people around you and and uh, and all that. And and I think sometimes when you disagree with people, you know, I don't know, you try to try to convey it in the most sort of democratic way that isn't like, um, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, fuck you. You know, it's uh, exactly you, yeah. you, you and, and, and Simon and Jason, the rubber band guys, again, sorry, I just worked with them. That's why I'm thinking of it so much. Sure. They're um, I, the they're the ones that, you know, I think we always have a really open conversation about it. And that's like really amazing that I feel like it's a really safe place to share my opinions and my thoughts and stuff and, and them, too. And we all kind of discuss it together and, and come to a consensus about what the best way to approach it is, you know. But okay. it's the same thing. It sounds kind of, you know, corny a little bit, but man, openness, honesty, you know, mm-hmm. all that. Um, and not drinking too much coffee. Mm. Do you like coffee or no? I do like coffee a lot. Yeah. I know, that's the problem. I, gotta be, yeah, I, do, I, do, I do decaf on set because I really like oh, the taste. Oh, really? Yeah, pro tip. Mm, I like the taste, but I get too fucking jazzed up when I, when I drink right. too much coffee. The problem I find sometimes these sets have like, cans of celsius and people are just Dude, like that's the last thing you need crazy <laughs> <laughs> that's the last thing you need in that situation right oh man mm. the are you good on time i just have like a couple i'm, last I'm chilling man i'm chilling i'm good until four so like you know whatever okay cool yeah, yeah um uh your feature that you shot compared to like all the commercials that you shoot did you feel that maybe you were strapped because maybe you felt limited resources or did you feel like a sense of freedom because you didn't have all the the toys maybe that you would normally have in commercials probably a little bit of both i think mm-hmm. i think um sometimes it can be overwhelming not that i've ever i've never done a commercial where the producer was like hey man we got infinite money on this you just get whatever you like you know i don't think yeah. i don't think i've point of fact i don't think i've ever done a single shoot no matter the budget where at some point the producer didn't say money's a little tight on this one you know <laughs> they could million dollar commercial uh five thousand dollar music video you know like it, it's always the the case um that there's not enough money for what you're trying to do but um but 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 yeah with, with the movie we were there were obviously it was much smaller scale, a lot more run and gun, you know? Um, but in a way that was sort of liberating, man, it was sort of mm. freeing, you know, it, it really was like, I think art is made of constraints. I think I find it really hard to be creative in just a vacuum. And like when right. I have parameters and maybe that's why I like cinematography in the first place is that like, you know, being a writer, uh, or a director, but really a writer, you know, you could look at a blank page and just be like, I can write anything, you know, but like, as a cinematographer, you're given a finite number of tools, you know, the mm. camera, the, the, the emulsion, the lenses, um, you know, the way that you can move the camera, the lights, but it, but it's, it's, it's a finite number of things. And so you have to use those and combine those in different ways, mm. um, and different formulas to, to make something, you know, new or different or that you're excited about or that works or looks good or whatever. And I think I like having those parameters a little bit. So in, in that same spirit, on the feature, yes, a little limiting. There were times it was frustrating to not have the stuff that we would normally yeah. do it, or the number of hands to move quickly that we would normally would. Sure. But it was, it was no, it, it actually was 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 kind of cool, you know, to work work within those parameters. Did you find like you had a different approach to maybe your style of shooting? Of course, it was a film that had a particular look given the story. But when I shot the feature, I noticed that my brain was kind of thinking of commercial where i have to have an eye light and everything i have to right, make right, 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 every right. level a proper exposure but for the film there are certain scenes that maybe an eye light wasn't necessarily maybe having the raccoon under the eyes actually made sense yeah, so it was yeah. like almost like thinking backwards it is a little bit you got to recalibrate a little bit for sure right. for sure 100 percent, dude it's it's pretty interesting that um that different dynamic I was, i'm so used to i remember like the first day on the feature of finishing a scene or getting a shot we were stoked about and then literally turning around to the AD to be like, 
what did the agency say about that? Did they approve? You know what I mean? <laughs> Before I was like, oh shit, there is no, you know, it's just Ryan, the director. Awesome. Like if he likes yeah, yeah. it, we're good, you know? Right. Um, but it was such a weird sort of like shock of, oh my God, I've been doing ads and shit for so long that like, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is interesting how you recalibrate. I think creatively too, how you approach it, how you light it and stuff. Mm. I, I don't, I don't know if, to be honest with you, it's terribly different. I try with commercials and stuff to, to maintain, I like naturalism a lot. I've always been interested in, in that, you know, the, um, the, the DPs who inspire me are DPs who make stuff that looks like it's real and it's not this like really yeah. Hollywood lit thing and all that. Um, so I, I've never, I think I've always strived to make commercial images look like they could hold up in a narrative world, um, for the most part. And, um, and so I, I don't, I didn't feel an enormous distinction there. It was more the, the, the big difference for me was working with actors. That was the biggest thing. And mm. working with real actors who, um, I did a part of a TV series with my friend, Sean James Grant in the UK earlier this year too, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and it was the same thing as working with real actors who like the, 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 the way that that happens, you know, that they, they come in and do rehearsals yeah. and then you tweak what they you're going like to do. Zone, they have to get into a zone or like a, sure. a mode. Yeah. A hundred percent. But, but facilitating that, you know, I remember on the TV show and on the feature a little bit where we would design shots, um, more on the show. Cause the, the visual language of that was a little bit more sort of composed, um, you know, that we would design shots that depended on specific blocking you know it would be mm. this tracking shot around the room but it meant that the lead had to walk all the way around the room while he's saying this thing and we would rehearse it and the actor would be like well, i'm not, I'm not why, why would i walk around the room that's not right you know right um and so then we'd have to, we, we built the whole fucking scene around that shot so now we had to recalibrate our whole approach so so that was the biggest shell shock to me in doing a feature versus a commercial and stuff is like when you do a commercial or a fashion or whatever you know it's, it's a lot easier to just sort of tell people what to do and they're going right. to do, you know, yeah, um, yeah. but working with real actors, that's a good point who have opinions about the characters and what they do and what their motivation is, is, um, it almost takes priority to it, be honest. It, it does. And honestly it should. Yeah. Because, right. because again, if the performance isn't there, if it doesn't feel real, if it doesn't feel natural, like the movie's no good. It doesn't matter how good it looks, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. Creating that space for the actors is like, I don't know. Again, that was one of the biggest takeaways is that that's like such a priority. Amazing. Yeah. I got one last question for Hit me, you. baby. Yeah. Uh, where you are in your life, your career at this point today, you're sitting at a table across from you is that version of you that's graduating school, but is also working, you know, with your friends. What advice would you give that younger version of you at that moment? <sighs> that's a really good question. I like that format a lot. Thank Boy, you. <laughs> I need to think about that for a sec. Yeah, no problem. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I brought it back right there. You did. You really did. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what advice would I give him? Um, fuck, man. Yeah, there's so much, dude. I don't know. You know what? Fuck it. I don't think I would. I don't think I would tell him anything, man. I think I'd let him stumble along and That's make okay. all the same mistakes I did, so he could learn it himself. You know what I tell mm -hmm. him? I don't know. Uh, you know, um, open a savings account. <laughs> there you go. But I, something practical. I don't know, dude. Because I think I think you know. I don't know if I. I it's it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's important to make all those mistakes. It's a tough question. Yeah, for sure. I, it's a wonderful question. You tell me. Yeah. What would you tell? What would you tell a younger version of yourself? To be more kind to myself, I think. To be honest, that's a wonderful answer, man. That's a wonderful yeah. answer. Yeah, I, absolutely. I've, I've asked it probably a dozen times already, and every time I go back to because there's moments in my life where I'm just beating myself up so much. And then at the end of the day, it always is okay. So like, I think for me, it's just be more kind and just allow yourself to make mistakes and go through life the way yeah. it's supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really, that's a really wonderful answer. I think that something like that is a, is a really good one. My friend, um, Luigi Rossi, who's a, a producer, uh, wonderful producer who I did a couple of my music videos early on. I remember he said to me, he's the same age. He's a young guy, just very pragmatic, very Italian. And he, um, <laughs> and he said, uh, I was so nervous before we did this music video. And he said, um, he said, what are you so nervous about? And I was like, I, I'm, you know, I just, what happens? What if this gets fucked up? That's get fucked up. It's all on my shoulders. And he said, look, he said, no matter what happens, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And the sun's gonna come tomorrow. <laughs> I love your little accent. You're going to come I know, I know. With all love, Luigi, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. But that—that—that that, that was always a, a. Maybe I would tell my younger self that too, man. It's—it's it's, uh, amazing. Life's about a lot more than just this. We all love it. We all love filmmaking and stuff. But um, I don't know. It's uh, I don't know. Amazing. That you could leave it there. Yeah. Sure. Call it a day.
Yeah, Perfect. nice. Well, dude, nice, nice chat, man. Thanks for Thank having you. me. This is, it yeah, was where, good. Uh, where can people find you? Share your share whatever you want for people to check out your work. Um, yeah, I mean, my website, patrickgolan.com, which should be everybody's homepage, by the way, if it's right. not already on there when they open up <laughs> Google <name>. Chrome. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, yeah, my website, Instagram, Pactron on Instagram. Um, cool. Again, my OnlyFans, I'll share that with you for the. Yep. <laughs> I'll put that in the link. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Cheers, dude. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Peace out.